congratulations on on this film. Thank you. Thank so, you. I, I did watch it. So you I, it? Oh, that's good. Yeah. So I so so I did watch it. So um, so tell me what sparked you to uh, basically come up with this this version of the story. Ah, uh, this is uh, this is my second feature, and um, I was I was working with um, my writing partner um, Damien Hill, and we we wanted we when we were away doing. Um, festivals with my first film, a film a feature called Pono. We seen a, we watched the at the festival this a film called um, Black, mm-hmm. and it was a it was a very modern retelling adaptation of Romeo and Juliet set in um, Belgium, and we loved it. And we did so we decided to um, really make an updated version of with the. I mean, for me, Shakespearean themes are universal you know and we wanted yeah. to deal with, we wanted to make something that dealt with sort of racial disharmony um corruption multiculturalism within the uh, within um, a modern day society within in australia which i think is a very white society and but there, it's such a big melting pot for so many different races coming in and we, we, we wanted to just showcase a bit of that about how it's still not ex- we feel we feel damien damien, damien and i felt that it's just not, it's still, it's still difficult here for different races coming into such a white society. Mm-hmm. And we, we wanted to sort of address a little bit of that within, but basically we wanted to tell a love story. And, and you did. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me, was it difficult to make adjustments taking a Shakespeare, you know, play into yeah. a multicultural society by changing, you know, some of the characters around. We did. I mean, if you look measure for measure, traditionally is a comedy, <laughs> and this is very much this is very much not a comedy. Um, by the end of the in the measure, Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, they all get together, they all get married, and they all live happily ever after. And Duke, the Duke comes out of um, exile, and get puts everyone together and, and it's all happy and funny and you know but you know we wanted to tell we wanted to make some we used we used the themes and the storyline from measure for measure uh, and then made it our own really it's very very loosely based on that story with you know criminal he leaves angelo as his overlord to look after things as a test and he goes away and in this story he comes back as a monk dressed as a monk so no one comes back to his kingdom mm-hmm. and so the Hugo weaving of the character um Hugo's character Duke he, his whole thing is looking looking back in the his little domain is all through the CCTV sort of and he's left Angelo in charge and Angelo's sort of like stuffing up mm-hmm. and so basically it was very it's a very very I would say a very very loosely based translation of measure for measure brought into a modern very modern day society i mean there's no we don't use any of shakespeare's words i think there's one line in there <laughs> <laughs> so why why the drama rather than a comedy ah uh, um the, our first film was a comedy um and it was, it was a drama, dramedy. There was a lot of comedy in it. It was, re, it was based in real people's real lives, and we we just wanted, to, you know, we wanted to make it a sort of raw, gritty, hard-hitting type of feature about crime elements and corruption within the police force, which you know <laughs> happens the world over, really, doesn't it? We just just never addressed, and we wanted to put all these different elements together and come up with something that's hopefully an audience um, affects an audience in different ways, you know, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in there. So, you know, you've got the love story, which I think, I think that was a hard thing. Um, As long as we've got the love story right and people believed in those two young lovers coming together, that's, that was a sort of glue for everything else to, to hang off. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I, and, and, I, yeah, I was going to say, I think the love story worked. I mean, the tragedy actually works. I mean, it, I I still feel the 
Shakespeare, you know, had had some influence. It, 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 so yeah, we we definitely wanted to keep make sure that because it's a big story, it's a big landscape. It's I mean, what, and, and what Shakespeare always is. So we, we definitely wanted to keep a hold of that and keep keep the nuances of Shakespeare in there with the tragedy and the bigness of the story and everything like that, but underpin it with uh, setting a, a real life world with um, gritty reality. Now, because it's loosely based on Shakespeare, why did you decide to keep some of the characters' names that was the same with the play? Why not just basically change all the names? Or is this sort of like a, like a dedication to Shakespeare? That's why you kept the same names. We, when writing it, um, we liked the names. I mean, we put them in at the beginning just so we knew what characters we were talking about and who we were addressing and where the journey was going. And when you're writing something, it sort of sticks with you. And, and it's, they're then hard to get rid of. You know, you learn how to, because that was, that was one of the things we talked about. Should we change all the names and stuff? I mean, even the title, you know, it's like, like um, My Private Idaho is like a, based on a Shakespeare um, play. And, but that, we, we talked about, discussed changing the title as well. Because you could, we could have easily have changed it. But Duke, we loved, we loved the, word, the name Duke. And Angelo, we loved them. And, um, you know, but then you, we've we've got Jawara and you know her family, which, which is all different. So we just we brought the two worlds together, really. Yeah, I, I do I do love it. I do love the multiculturalism that uh, that you actually uh, brought into uh, this this type of project. Could you talk about the the tragedy that you brought? you know, at the beginning of the movie that kind of basically sparked the story. Because as us Americans, we have this impression that there are no guns in Australia. <laughs> well, the, you know, there's, the, there's a guy in the moment is up at, um, which is in New Zealand, in the, the Christchurch killings, of which he went, in, he went into that mosque and killed like 30 odd people. So, you know, it, it does happen. I know it's not, obviously not as um, regular as it does in the US where yeah. you know, I think you get sort of school killings and a weekly basis and stuff, don't you? And, but I just wanted to, that was, that was, that happens. It does happen. And you know, there, we've had cases of people in, in Melbourne driving a car through the city and killing a lot of people and stuff, you know, it, there's, there's all these incidents that happen across the world. And we, it's also, that was, that was also dealing with, there's, there's a, a line within that of that character's backstory where people are thrown into society and he was actually an ex-war veteran. Mm -hmm. And he started, to, and it, that was to deal with the ice epidemic, drug epidemic, and, but he was actually, I know, you know, he'd fought for his country and he came back in and sometimes people are thrown into society and um, not not help, there's no, there's no sort of like, um, Back help for them when, and they're not dealing with stuff and and he sort of he just went loose and went a bit crazy and um then started f feeling he was back in a war zone type thing that's that's what we, the essence of what we were trying to get there with him but it is it is the trigger for the whole um story to kick off really and yeah, okay. you know and it's and it was also to come up like love can come come out of tragedy because that's what happens with it these tragic circumstances and then this beautiful little love story sort of flowers out of it mm -hmm. yeah I've, I've i caught i caught that message could you talk about the uh doing the production in this sort of like um this urban jungle this this you know concrete building apartment complex that you actually uh you know uh, com compiled the from yourself. they're called the commission flats over here in australia and it's um it's where Basically, if the sort of they're amazing, it's an amazing place. They're, it's like it, we wanted to make that place like another character within the story, and um, that was and group um, Duke and his and Percy's offside. They'd sort of grown up, and that's the sort of it was to sort of mirror the rock, the other side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. You know, you can still and so he grew up there and would never leave there, even though now. Nowadays, it's sort of social housing, you know, and it's the lowest sort of 
denominator, pe people coming in, immigrants coming into the country, they're always put into these places now. But back back in the day, he grew up there and it was, he, he would never leave there, but that's his domain. He rules it and it's, that's his kingdom of these old flats, the, the commission flats. And we, want, we wanted to make that um, like just another character, this world within a world, really about the commission flat. And plus architecturally and aesthetically, I think they're beautiful. <laughs> what, what, was it hard to capture that, um, you know, that culture, that uh, sort of like that classism that, that was actually, you know, going around in that type of society? Oh, it's, you know, that was the hardest thing to get when we were sort of like um, in pre-production was to actually get permission to go and film there because um, you've got their old government run and everything like that and so but once we got it once we we went to the top really we went to um the head of housing and mps and everything and rather than starting at the bottom and trying to work up about getting the, the sort of like a, a, allowing us to do it i went to the top and then they said yes and but once we were in there filming the people there were amazing really helpful they, it, there's such a community of people living there and they all got behind the film and they, they went out of their way to um, they were making, they were coming down and we, we used a lot of them as extras and they came on to, they came on to the set, a lot of them on the, were in the, on the set and um, they would come to for lunch, a lot of the people that ran it and stuff and they became, they became part of the sort of film family when we were doing it, which was beautiful. Um, we really, really, really appreciated all the help and love that they showed. Um, been making but you know saying that we had a few incidents because there's a lot of people with drug problems and stuff like there and um, we had a few incidents happening but on the whole it was a great filming experience work, um, using the flats excellent could you talk about your cast because as us americans the only the only big name that we recognize would be hugo we weaving himself because of the you know lord of the rings franchise but could you talk yeah. about you know how perfect your cast actually is there i think they're amazing like megan megan who plays um jawara she she's just she was just out of drama school so she's like very much uh, a newcomer and i think she i think she gives a stunning performance a lovely performance in it um you've got you've got harrison gilbertson who's the other the young uh love the, the um who plays the who she falls in, they fall in love with. Um, character, his name escapes me right now. <laughs> and um, he's he's got a little career happening. He was he was in a a, a, a Amer couple of American films. He's done quite a good, got a career. He lives in New York now. He's a brilliant young actor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so those t those two, he's he's a very up and coming. He did a Stephen uh, Stephen King film last year. Uh, and I nearly never got him for this because he was filming this Stephen King film over in America. It was a Netflix thing, and then he, it it just it just worked out perfectly. Hmm. And I think he's brilliant. We've got Faisal Faisal um, who who plays Jaiwara's um, brother, Faisal Bazi. Um, he's he's you know very he's on the cusp of doing sort of big things. Um, and you know, I think I think the cast are, I think the cast have come across really, really, really well in it. You know, they're all they're all pretty much very well established Australian actors, mm -hmm. apart from Megan, who is like and um, and Harrison, who's young, but he'll be. He, I think Harrison has got the potential to become a little uh, little movie star. Ex excellent, excellent. So now, since you have a comedy under your belt and now a drama under your belt. What's, what's going to be next for you? Oh, uh, who knows? I'm working on quite a few things. Because um, we, we're, in, we're in lockdown at the moment over here um, because of the COVID. We, Melbourne's been back into lockdown, so we can get out the, ho the house for an hour a day to go and exercise. Or, yeah, and then we've got a curfew at 8 o'clock at night. You're not allowed out after 8 o'clock at night. And they're, they're being very strict with it. So I've got plenty of time in my hands to do a bit of writing. And um, so I'm working on a, I'm working on a few things. I'm working in this TV series with my brother, which is quite good. And also, I'm working on a, a comedy sort of crime caper. Um, it's a, 
it's a bit, it's, a, it's about a Rod Stewart impersonator mm-hmm. who, and this very rich femme fatale um, sort of pretends she's in love with him and, um, it's, it's, and, but she actually wants him to kill her husband. And it's, so it's a, <laughs> and it's, I mean, he's, he's just this hopeless Rod Stewart impersonator that just goes around the clubs and, and she's this beautiful femme fatale and they, they so it's, well, I'm working on that at the moment, which is a lot of fun. Wow, you can't believe you're keeping so busy despite a despite a lockdown. I mean, uh, wow. we're 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 not even really locked down over here, but I guess that's that's our problem over here. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, it's been it's been nuts over there. It's it's not even getting any better, is it? With the no. amount of cases. Now and, what... and, flu, and flu season comes next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> God, it'll be. The, wor- the world just went crazy at the moment. It's a very surreal place to be living in. It, it really feels, it really feels strange place to like, be living at. Because look at all the things we've had. You know, we've had the whole Black Life Matters. We've, you've, you've got the fires going on. You've got COVID across the world, and and then you've got all the other things going on in the world at the moment as well, which seem secondary. You know, <laughs> right. all the other world problems, and they all seem secondary at the moment compared to this pandemic we're in. Yeah, ho- ho- hopefully we get back to the normal routines and uh, come up with I, great, great stories again. <laughs> I know, but, but that will become what is the new normal. You know, what is the new normal at the moment? It's um, we just we just don't know. We we don't know what how we're all going because there's no end game. There's no there's no end game at the moment, is there? No, no. Did does did in Australia do they have a different type of uh, like filming rules that hopefully that they they will establish soon? Well, actually, um, there's a show over here called Neighbors, and uh, very popular show. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the casting director, um, Thea McLeod, who was cast that she cast my uh, my film, and they they've they've continued filming through it. They've worked. I think they're one of the only productions in the world that actually managed to work a way of to carry on filming. I think they shut down for a few weeks, and but they're, they're up and running. And a few other productions are starting to get up and running now as well. It's, um, but you know, every, that's, that's the one thing about the industry is like everyone has needed film. Uh, it's one of the hardest hit industries, but that's the one thing that everyone's been doing is watching films and TV shows and binging on them. So it's, it just shows you how much of a necessity the the art form is. I think you you are absolutely right. So hopefully we'll we'll pull pull out through this, and hopefully it it only lasts just for another few months. <laughs> uh, that would be a nice gig, wouldn't it? <laughs> it, it would be. Well, hey, hey, thank you very much uh, for speaking with me for Measure for Measure. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it. So it's, a, it's very, very dramatic. I love the love story, the multicultural love story. It's almost yeah. uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, is there is, there is yeah, there's, there's, there's essences of that and sentiments of that in it, for sure. Yeah, but, and, uh, and I just want to tell you, I think that ending was perfect. It was, it was very Shakespearean in my, in my view. <laughs> oh, you know what? Thank you. Thank you very much. Because there's been a lot of, um, oh, should I have killed Duke at the end and stuff like that. But I think, you know, he's in that world. My whole best thing of that was in that world, you're always looking over your shoulder. There's always someone coming up to t- try and take over the mantle, you know, of the king or the duke. And and it was just a little um, foot soldier that came up and did it at the end. And But because that... That's always split opinion that the ending about with people going, Oh no, you can't kill Duke. You can't kill Hugo Weaving. And um but I decided to keep it in. Um and I like it. Well, I, I like it too. You know what? You did a good job because people will talk about it after they watch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Anyways, hey, thank you very much for speaking with me. Um perhaps Absolutely. next time. Absolute pleasure, man. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you. Bye now. Take take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.